Welcome to the Personal Injury Law Show. This is a show that talks about everything current in the law of personal injuries. We talk about Victorian law, interstate law, in particular tonight we're going to be talking about South Australian law. My name is Tony Carbone, I'm a lawyer of 30 years experience. With me tonight I've got Nuncio Tartaya, a partner in a law firm in Victoria. Good evening Nunz. Good evening Tony, viewers, welcome. And Chris Katsoulis, a partner in a law firm in South Australia. Good evening Chris. Good evening Tony, good evening viewers. Viewers tonight, stay tuned because we're going to be talking about South Australian law and in particular, Public Liability, Civil Liability Act 1936 and all its updates and how it affects you, the viewer, in South Australia. Tony, now, before we kick off, what's in the news? Well, Nunce, Chris, there's been a lot of stories. What's really tragic in the uh, economy at the moment is the loss of jobs. Qantas this morning have announced that they're going to axe up to 5,000 jobs, mm. Nunce. That's a oh. big number, isn't it? Well, just the other day, I think they forecasted 2,000 jobs. Now it's gone up to 5,000, uh, Tony. And Look, it's becoming a trend this year. I think every time you uh, look at the Herald Sun in the morning, there's, uh, you know, in the industries, we're losing industry in, in Victoria. We are, we uh, are. It's, and it's Chris, sad. a lot of job losses. There'd be a lot of people at work that would be working with injuries under sufferance to make sure that they have got a job. What would your advice to viewers be That's if correct. you do, if you're in that situation? Well, I mean, a similar situation is in, uh, in South Australia uh, in relation to the manufacturing industry, as the viewers may be aware. Uh, the Holden plant has announced that uh, it'll be shutting down in 2016. Uh, the manufacturing industry does have um, a lot of injuries. Uh, if the situation arises where um, a manufacturing plant shuts down and people are without work uh, and they have injuries, then they need to seek uh, advice in relation to what rights they may have legally about their, those entitlements uh, and about where their future lies. Um, because if they have injuries, then the uh, they may have an entitlement to compensation. And Nance, what's important is they should get advice before the place shuts down because it could impact on their rights because then the insurer will turn around and say, you've only claimed because you've been retrenched. Exactly right. It's a perception thing. If you, know, you, you make the claim after you've been retrenched, it just doesn't look good. Even though it might be a genuine claim, uh, you'd rather do it beforehand. So if you do have an injury before uh, you, know, you think you may be retrenched, go see a lawyer straight away. Exactly. That's right. Let's keep moving. This is another tragic and sad case. A young fellow, young boy, 15-year-old, uh, mm. has died from a nut allergy. Now, it came down to staff shortages, nonce. Tell us a bit about this case. Yeah, look, poor Jack, Jack Irvine, I think his name was. Uh, he was at a development camp for go-karting. Uh, and on the first day of the camp, they were under-resourced, under-staffed, and they didn't have time to... Uh, I think they do their daily cooking, so they just ordered some Subway, and part of that order was uh, some, I think, uh, <coughs> some biscuits or cookies, uh, whatever you call them. And uh, unfortunately, uh, one of those obviously had nuts in him, and he had a, an allergy, and and he died uh, shortly thereafter. And the worst part about this case, though, is that uh, the family notified the camper of his allergies and said that you know that if he has them, he's in trouble, and um, they had no practices to prevent that. So it's 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 a sad story. Chris, if that's in, it's happened quite a bit in Australia of late, where people have died of allergies, nuts, fish, shellfish, these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. If this happened in South Australia, would there be an entitlement to compensation under the public liability laws? Because in Victoria, we would be able to sue for nervous shock. That's right. You've got yes. a threshold to, mm. yeah. Well, yes, there would be a claim. Um, I think the circumstances of this claim in particular, um, there is a suggestion that uh, the association uh, we're aware of uh, a number of children, including Jack, that had some allergies um, and the findings were that um, sufficient policies weren't um, taken uh, or prepared in, in the context of um, this association uh, and unfortunately Jack uh, suffered in those circumstances. So he definitely would have a claim or the family would have a claim uh, in relation to it. And he and Victoria, once you'd have to what, show 10% 
psychiatric impairment. Yeah, the it's not very high, is it? Yeah, the family or you know, um, or any sort of related party have to show a 10 uh, over 10 percent uh, psychiatric impairment. Which, look, under these circumstances, I, I don't think it'd be an issue, Tony. But I think on the show we've spoken a lot about these similar cases. I think in the yeah, we, cadets it's as well. A lot. That's uh, why I'm bringing it up. They're just not uh, not doing the right things. No, so. no. Let's get moving. Mum's deaf is being probed at the moment. She's pregnant, 32 weeks, goes to a hospital, they check her out, they send her home, bang, she dies the next day. Uh, this, this is another sad story. I hate to say it's all sad stories at the moment, but uh, uh, this is a story in which she obviously had some issues, went to the hospital. First there was a, uh, an argument about which hospital she could go to. She wanted to go to the St Vincent's, but uh, she remained at the Royal Melbourne. Uh, eventually they sent her home, I think the next day, just diagnosed her with, I think, musculoskeletal pain. Um, and then I think the next day she fainted and she passed away and also uh, later the child um, died as well. And cur currently it's before the coroner and um, I think she was diagnosed with a, an aneurysm in the spleen artery, in, which they say is a common, uh, I think, problem. Occurrence. Yeah, occurrence. Well, she wanted to go to the hospital of her choice, yeah. which is where her doctors were, her which was the St Vincent's, Chris. Mm. And the sad <clears throat> thing about it, just like the last case with the nuts, this could have been prevented. That's the sad thing. Yeah. Isn't that right? What was interesting about this case as well was that um, the mother, um, during the inquest, um, was saying that uh, the ambulance staff um, and the hospital staff were having an argument about uh, which hospital was the appropriate location um, for this woman to be treated. Um, and it seems that uh, the incorrect choice was made. I, I don't get it, because the fact that she it says that she's got pub, pub, uh, private health, she should have a choice to go to whichever hospital she likes. That's, that's how I would view it's it. It's just am insane. I, am I wrong? Yeah. It is, yeah, it's just bizarre. Just shows you they must be so understaffed and under-resourced that they're making decisions that are really haphazard. Yeah. And look, we don't mean to attack the hospital system because people out there do a great job, but these are preventable things that should never happen, really. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, a simple uh, scan may have prevented it. Yeah, exactly. Chris, this concerns uh, the coroner investigating a couple of deaths in South Australia. Uh, a couple of morbidly obese people have gone in for surgeries. It concerns their post-operative care. Tell us a bit more about this case. Uh, this case involves two uh, individuals who attended uh, an orthopaedic clinic in South Australia. Um, they were morbidly obese, as Tony mentioned. They went into hospital for routine orthopaedic uh, surgical procedures. Um, the uh, surgical procedures uh, on the facts were successful, uh, but because of their pre-morbidly uh, obese condition, uh, some complications developed and unfortunately both of these individuals passed away. Um, it was found in the inquiry or in the inquest that uh, had the hospital um, have had assessed their condition um, beforehand and taken the necessary or made the necessary assessment of risk um, uh, and I think one of the issues that was found in this case was that if the hospital was equipped with a, uh, a high dependency unit mm. um, then this could have been uh, avoided. Oh it's, cr it's crazy because uh, the gentleman that unfortunately passed away, Mr Ryan, he only went in for ankle surgery. Yeah, it's insane. Uh, and look I appreciate that obviously he had uh, you know, conditions beforehand, but ankle surgery then for one day later to pass away. It's, well, it's, it's Chris, terrific. Chris, nonce, there's been stories where they're saying they're trying to get people fit before they go in for surgeries, mm. which is a pretty important thing, I would imagine. And plus the coroner made a recommendation that the hospital should have a clear policy on whether to admit high-risk patients. I would have thought that if there's some risk to the patient of having complications, they should be admitted, not just take the it chance and send them home. We've got to go to a sponsor's break. Viewers, stay tuned. After the break, we're going to come back and explain to you South Australian law and public liability in particular. Welcome back to the show. Tonight we're going to be talking about public liability and in particular the South Australian law. But what we might do is compare South Australian with Victorian law and that's why we've got Chris Katsoulis. Now, Nuncio, in simple terms, what is public liability law? 
Basically, Tony, everything that falls outside of, I, I say, work accidents and transport accidents. It slips, it falls uh, at you know, private premises, supermarkets, schools, uh, nightclubs, instances at nightclubs, everything outside, I say, work and transport accidents. But All right, I'm going to add a couple more things. Accidents on planes, uh, pubs and clubs, defective products, and believe it or not, dog and animal bites. So it picks up a lot of things, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, it does. Chris, in South Australia, what is the main, main piece of legislation that deals with these sorts of claims? Well, it's the uh, Civil Liability Act 1936. So it's, a, it's an old act, um, but covers uh, all entitlements that individuals who suffer injuries in public places um, uh, are entitled to claim. Look, our, our act in uh, Victoria is obviously the Wrongs Act, which we've mentioned uh, on numerous occasions on the show. And look, in, in reading the two different acts, Tony, look, they've got some similarities. They've got a lot of similarities, but there's been some significant and subtle changes in recent times. The Wrongs Act's 1958, but it's a significant amendment in 2003. Okay. So it's important that viewers, if they do get injured in these circumstances, they do get advice from a lawyer that specialises in this area. That's, That's important. Exactly. That's correct. Chris, what's a prerequisite to lodge a claim in South Australia under the public liability laws? Well, if you have an injury, the first thing that needs to happen is you need to um, give notice of an intention to claim. Um, you need to prove uh, that uh, the occupier um, or the owner of premises, for example, if that's where it, where it occurred, um, failed in their duty of care um, and that they were negligent. Well, can I stop you there for a minute? The first major difference between Victoria and South Australia is you need to give a notice of intention to claim. What does that entail? Uh, to commence a claim, uh, firstly, uh, you need to give notice to uh, the owner or the occupier of the premises uh, uh, where the incident occurred. Um, you need to report the incident, obviously, to uh, your medical practitioners. Um, usually the owner of the or the occupier of the premises have uh, insurers um, and normally the steps that are taken are to, uh, to ask the owner or the occupier to, to notify their insurers to commence the claim. Correct. If you don't do that, what happens? Well, if you don't do that, then uh, there could be an argument that the owner or the occupier have been substantially prejudiced uh, in their ability to investigate or defend their position uh, and your claim may fail. Chris, with that uh, notice though, is there a time limit with it? Because, you know, obviously if there are, I would have thought it's, it's, it's imperative that you see a lawyer straight away. Uh, under the court rules, there is a requirement that uh, you give notice of a claim within 90 days um, before commencing um, uh, an action in court. Uh, and the, the reason behind that simply is to give an opportunity to the parties to try and resolve the matter out of court. Um, but the court rules say that if you, the insurer, um, on behalf of the owner or the occupier, uh, does not respond within 60 days, then uh, you can commence court Pretty proceedings. Nice. Nunce, yeah. in any claim, it's very important that things happen quick anyway because the defendant wants to investigate the incident, correct? Yep. You might want to get witnesses. It's very, very important that a particular person that's injured consults a lawyer to get the right steps. Uh, and most importantly, Tony, preserving evidence, CCTV footage, uh, incident reports, you want to get that straight away because that, you know, that will help you formulate your case from the get-go. And especially in South Australia, if you need to... Uh, effectively make an offer 90 days before uh, issuing any proceedings, you need to have or formulate a claim and, and that's, that's a, big, a big distinction between I think Victorian and South Australian laws. Exactly. No, I agree with that. Uh, I think a key element in these cases is to make sure that um, the, the necessary investigations are conducted as quickly as possible um, uh, because liability often is disputed um, and so viewers I suggest that if in circumstances where you're not sure you should consult a lawyer. Tell me about the seven day rule. What's it say before you can lodge a claim? Because it's a lot lax, more lax than what it is in Victoria. Well there's a threshold um, in South Australia uh, uh, to, to qualify for, uh, for compensation or damages entitlements. Um, uh, as long as you can prove that there's a, uh, at least a seven day significant impairment um, then you can claim. And nuts. You know what that means? What does that mean? You're sick for seven days, uh, essentially. Yeah, well, that, that is a big change from uh, from Victorian law because we've got well, what the are five, we doing in Victoria. We've got the five percent impairment, so you've got to get over five percent. Oh, this is for your physical injuries or ten percent for your psychological injuries, and it's a lot uh, harder to get over than uh, seven days being significantly impaired. That's correct. And nuts. We're not telling viewers to embellish or whatever, but how you present and how you convey your symptoms and consequences to medical practitioners 
could impact on the 5% in Victoria, correct? Exactly. Yeah. exactly right. And you've had instances where people have had surgeries and they've still missed out. Yeah, I've had, uh, unfortunately, I've had some clients who have had back surgery and you think that's a, a Monty for over 5% impairment, even though not everyone's training those guides. And unfortunately, um, it hasn't, hasn't worked out for the clients. So, exactly. Yeah. Well, so. can I just say in South Australia, even though there's a seven day significant impairment threshold, which appears not to be um, uh, difficult to overcome, it's very important that you consult with the doctor um, as early as possible so that there's a record of the injuries um, so that you can gather that information and, later. And so along with that seven days significantly impaired, I understand there's also a prescribed medical expenses amount that you have to incur before you can claim for your pain and suffering, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, the prescribed medical expenses, it's indexed annually, um, uh, but it's, it's approximately $3,200 for an injury that occurred in 2013. Um, but it's a, it's a seven day significant impairment or um, reaching the so it's the, all okay yeah the prescribed threshold. But to hit three thousand two hundred, if you got an injury, wouldn't take much when you've got X rays. That's correct. You got MRI scans. You got physio treatment. Med it wouldn't yeah. take much to get to three thousand. Oh, and if you have surgery, then exactly that, that's already gone. That's correct. Viewers, usually when you're dealing with these claims, duty of care in most instances is presumed. We need to show that there's a breach and issues of causation. In simple language, Don, what's that mean? Effectively, uh, if you've got a, an injury, the most, I think, prominent, obviously, issue is that you've got to prove fault. So you've got to prove that someone is at fault for your injuries. And basically, what the, there's a lot of legal elements which we won't confuse you with, but basically got to show that the defendant failed to exercise reasonable care. And that due to their failure, it's a cause of your injuries. Yep. It can't be just a breach of, you know, a duty of care, oh, dear, and yeah. it doesn't cause the injury. You might yeah. have, you know, they might have left a uh, spilt liquid on a supermarket floor, but you fell by reason of, uh, you know, another means. Well, obviously, the causation argument's not going to stack up, then, is it? So no, that's correct. no. Well, the the paramount importance is uh, if you enter a premises um, that your safety um, is cared for, and if it's not, and you suffer injuries, then you can claim. Assuming your logic claim, what are different heads of damages you can get in South Australia? Well, in South Australia, you get pain and suffering. Um, you can get past and future um, economic loss yes. uh, or future earning capacity, as it's called in the legislation. Um, you can get uh, past and future gratuitous or voluntary services. Um, if you have permanent injuries into the future as well, you can get uh, home help or future paid domestic assistance. You can also have your past and future medical expenses covered. Um, if you're in a marriage, you can also uh, potentially claim a loss of consortium. Um, and there are also costs that can be claimed in this jurisdiction. And nonce, mm. Chris has mentioned quite a few heads of damages. The only one that's probably can't claim in Victoria is loss of consortium. Yeah, I was going to say it's almost identical to uh, you know Victorian legislation and you know the gratuitous care and so forth. Is there a threshold for the gratuitous care? Viewers, we'll get back to this issue of what gratuitous services are just after the break. So stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Before the break, we're talking about the different heads of damages under public liability. Gratuitous services, Chris, what's that mean? Gratuitous services basically means services voluntarily provided to an injured person by uh, a certain group of people. Um, uh, the legislation specifies that it has to be either a, a, a spouse, a domestic uh, partner, um, a, a child or a parent. In other words, viewers, if you didn't have one of those people that Chris mentioned, you'd have to hire people from the outside and it cost you probably $30 an hour, at the very least. That's correct. Okay. In addition to gratuitous services, you've got loss of income. Yep. And it's pretty big in South Australia. Oh, yeah. So compared to Victoria, it's, uh, I think it caps at around $2.2 million. Is that correct, Chris? That's correct. And in Victoria, not? Uh, well, it's just over a million dollars. So it's, it's not much, is no, it? No, it's not much at all. No, and no. Uh, So it just shows how the, the schemes are different at times. So. Yeah, that's right. And Chris, loss of consortium. What's that mean? We don't have that in Victoria. Loss of consortium basically is uh, a loss suffered by uh, a domestic partner or a spouse uh, as a result of injuries suffered. So in effect, nonce, 
the relationship isn't as good as it was before the injuries. Yeah, and I would have thought in Victoria that just goes to pain and suffering, Tony, wouldn't you think? Well, they used to have it, and they abolished it about 15 years ago. Look, the, the, the assessment of damages in relation to the loss of consortium is not a significant amount unless there are serious injuries, permanent injuries uh, in a li that extend to lifetime. What, what I'm really interested in, Chris, is the pain and suffering damages. Because, you know, look, in Victoria, that's probably the most common form of head of damage that you claim because in slips and falls, that's, you know, there's not, sometimes you're not working, you're at housewife, so pain and suffering is the most common form of head of damage. So what does pain and suffering cap at in Victoria, in South Australia? Well, in South Australia, the, uh, the Civil Liability Act applies. Um, there's a scale of between zero points to 60 points. Um, and it max, well, sorry, caps at uh, 321,410 so, for the worst imaginable injury. And how would you get that? What would you have to do? Well, I mean, you'd have to, uh, someone, for example, who becomes a quadriplegic uh, okay. qualifies uh, arguably for that. So if you satisfy that seven uh, significantly impaired days or the prescribed amount, then you fit within that scale. And if you get 60, then it's effective 321,000. That's correct. No, it's mm. A significant difference between Victoria and South Australia is that uh, Victoria is a lot more generous in terms of pain and suffering. Yeah. But South Australia is a lot more generous in terms of loss of income. That's correct. But, and Nunce, remember recently you ran the case of the lady who lost her eye. Yeah. And the court gave us over one point something million, but it was brought back to the statutory max. Yeah, she was ordered, uh, I think it was $1.1 million in damages, but, uh, you know, the most you could get under that head of damage was 500000 So How much would you get for a loss of an eye in your, just roughly, Chris? Oh, for a loss of an eye, I mean, it depends on, obviously, the, the effect it had on work, but uh, potentially it could be a, a significant amount of money. Okay, okay, so it could be very close to what we got, or, say, the cap, 324, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, what, uh, <coughs> I mean, the difference in South Australia, um, uh, a lot, of, a lot of individuals who suffer injury, when they receive advice uh, in relation to the maximum pain and suffering threshold, um, often that discourages them uh, on the basis that it, uh, it's, it's not reasonable compensation for a, an injury as severe as quadriplegia, for example. Um, but it's the other heads of damage that um, amount to a significant compensation claim. Just quickly, Tony, something that would interest you, uh, if it does go to trial these matters, no jury. The injured parties are generally not overly educated and I'm not having to go at the poor injured people, and they're getting cross-examined by skilled technicians, which are QCs that have been on their feet arguing cases up and down for the last 30 plus years, mm. and they do rip them apart. Yep. Juries are too, they, they look at it too, too closely, and they think people are being evasive because they can't stand up to this cross-examination. Mm. Without a jury, I think you get a judge who's been in the system uh, for a long time, and they can understand the vagaries of being cross-examined by someone with those skills. I agree. Do you, do you agree? I Chris? agree with that. Yeah. Yep. And it shortens the trial significantly, doesn't it? Nice. I think that's probably the key factor. The fact, some of these trials, I think, would shorten by at least almost two thirds of the time. Because at least, uh, you know, we've got a matter at the court, in court at the moment where, because there's so many uh, interlocutory steps we have to go through before it's been six days into the, the court case, we have not impaneled the jury yet. Problem with juries is everyone's playing up to the jury. Everyone's trying to impress the jury instead of getting on with the case. You're trying to impress the jury. Anyway. There was a colleague recently who an umbrella wasn't properly secured, Chris, lifted off the ground with a gust of wind, spun around, got him in the face. Well, in South Australian law, uh, that case would definitely qualify um, to claim. And uh, if, if a situation like that occurs, then I think the, the best thing to do is to seek legal advice. So there is a claim. Now, tell me in brief, what are the recent changes in the car accident laws, which are very important? Okay, well since uh, 1 July 2013, the Civil Liability Act has been amended. Um, the, uh, there are th new thresholds, basically, that have been introduced um, in South Australian law for individuals that are injured in motor vehicle accidents. The previous Civil Liability Act allowed for a claim uh, to be made similar to public liability claims, uh, where you've got a seven day significant impairment. Um, now the new changes to the laws require that you reach a, a certain threshold of injury under a injury scales value. But there are also exceptions um, if you can uh, determine that those injuries, if they don't qualify for those thresholds, um, are harsh or unjust, then you can potentially still claim. Nunes, mm. we've had these changes for a long time in Victoria. As a serious injury test, South Australia's got harsh and unjust. You'd almost just about qualify anyone, wouldn't you? Well, I was going to say is that it's so open-ended. It is. Uh, it'd be interesting. Now, obviously, it's just been passed. Inter interesting to see once it get, does get tested. What, you know, what does that mean? That's correct. The public, unfortunately, with uh, uh, the media attention to these changes, um, uh, 
have, uh, even including their medical practitioners, have been scared off with these changes to the legislation. Um, the reality is, is that with these harsh and unjust provisions, uh, there are still strong, uh, there is still strong potential for claims to be made. Um, so I, I'd urge uh, all viewers, if they're involved in a situation uh, that they're unsure of, that they should seek legal advice. Not thanks to come on board. Chris, we'll have you on in the future. My pleasure. Viewers, don't forget to go to Facebook, Twitter, all the other social media platforms we've got. Stay tuned for future episodes. Don't forget to go to past episodes and always remember to stay safe.